Great to be back with everybody once again. This is the last video in this series of just trying to put things back together in perspective, just reorient our minds, what we're dealing with, um, the um, disease of COVID-19 and how you as an individual can prepare yourself for the upcoming summer and the upcoming fall. Just reorienting ourselves as well to this idea of the 80-25, 80% of people who get exposed to this have no symptoms, or, or have minimal symptoms and don't need really an interaction with the healthcare system. 20% do of that, about 5% will need intensive care, um, which can inc include intubation. And so how can we boost our immune systems? How can we improve our bias systems to um, combat this? There's been a new understanding that's come out in the last week or two about this disease in relation to inflammation. And so one of the things that kind of spurred my interest in this was data from New York as far as hospitalizations in New York. So what I want to do is I want to look at those numbers real quick, real briefly, and then go through this new idea of what actually may be the underlying cause for the, the, the disparity or the weirdness or the uniqueness or the, all the different things we can't quite explain with the disease. What could be the, the underlying thing that might help us understand all of these things? This is a summary from an article that was published, which will be attached below um, from patients hospitalized in New York City. Now, one of the things we weren't quite expecting with this disease, initially, as you all may remember, we were expecting to hit people with lung problems, asthmatics, patients with um, COPD, sleep apnea. We're expecting those people to be hard hit by this disease. But for admissions um, in New York, we only saw 9% of patients with asthma, 5% of patients with COPD, and 3% of people with, with um, sleep apnea. Those numbers roughly correlate with the general population in New York. So what we saw, what we see from the New York data is you don't see a difference in the people being admitted to the hospital with these underlying issues. The big difference you see is with hypertension, heart disease, and especially with obesity. So people with hypertension, you know, 57% of the patients um, admitted to the hospital had hypertension versus 29% in the general population. Over 42% um, had a BMI over 30, 11% with coronary artery disease, 7% with CHF. So one of the things is how can you explain weight being a major admission characteristic um, or hypertension being a major risk characteristic. Well, by now we most of us know about the ACE2 receptor. And for those who are, are practitioners, we use um, angiotensin converting enzyme medications for blood pressure control, for heart attack prevention, for stroke prevention, for saving people's kidneys. If you're a diabetic, we'll use ACE inhibitors to actually help protect your kidneys. So we've been using these medications for quite some time. In the um, functional integrative world, uh, we will use certain ARBs like um, um, or starting to treat inflammation in people with chronic mold illness related to the tissue-like growth factor 1 beta, which is one of these cytokines. So the idea of this, this angiotensin system um, related with inflammation is not a new concept, but now we're understanding, wait a second, maybe just maybe this is related with patients being admitted with COVID-19. So oxidative stress is the underlying issue between all of these things. This is a little graph showing oxidative stress and how we can see that with things like stroke, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ARDS, rheumatoid arthritis, a whole host of different disease processes. And where oxidative stress lives is in the, in the endothelium. These are the smallest vessels that line every artery in your body. It's also where the ACE2 receptor lives, and it's also where, if you remember these little microclots for people with the decreased oxygen to the lungs, it's where that lives, or strokes, where those things lives. And so it appears that oxidative stress may be the underlying issue that um, explains the pleiotrophic or pleomorphic. That's just a fancy way of saying the multifaceted and multi-shaped um, presentation of this COVID-19 disease. One of the things that, that's interesting with oxidative stress as well is that that system has a, a huge association with reactive oxygen species or inflammation and the um, angiotensin II receptor. So to simplify that inflammation, that's what it comes down to, inflammation. Inflammation may be the underlying reason why this goes wild. Wait a second. Our tocolizumab, you know, the um, drugs used to treat this, that's an anti-inflammatory. Wait a second. Some of these things like IV vitamin C are anti-inflammatories. Wait a second. Some of these anti-parasitic medications are being used for their anti-inflammatory effects. So it appears that some of the emerging data is maybe just maybe oxidative stress at the level of the small vessels. And that would also explain why 
this the lung presentation is different. You can have some people with an ARDS like fluid in the lungs. You can have some people who have low compliance lungs where their lungs are working well, but there's no oxygen in there. And other people are having microclots, small little clots in the arteries around their lungs and getting decreased oxygenation. That one thing would kind of tie together. And then a few, some of you all are hearing about these strokes in young people. That's one thing that would tie all this together. It also would explain why Sometimes you hear about people going home and getting sick later on because the inflammatory process is still going on, even though the virus in the blood has been mostly resolved. Now, this, this wheelhouse of um, inflammation is also where integrative and functional medicine live. Um, and in our world, we realize inflammation is an underlying cause for diabetes, Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, and a whole host of other diseases. And we've been working on inflammation treatment in this world for decades. And we have some of the, the top thought leaders, whether it's Dr. Houston at Vanderbilt or Dr. Bredensen um, at UCLA or Dr. Mullen um, and Fasciano at Hopkins and Harvard. Those are teachers or educators in our world that have been in this oxidative stress and inflammation world for um, years, if not decades. Here's another graphic showing this in a little different way, showing how obesity can, and diabetes and cancer um, with oxidative stress can be related with things like um, inflammation, um, increased risk of cancer. Um, it's really quite interesting because in the um, nutritional world, in the functional nutritional world, we use things like whole grains, like fiber to help decrease inflammation. We'll use things like omega-3s, nuts, seeds, vitamin C, things um, like um, carotenoids found in your orange and yellow foods. Um, and these are all things that we've had data for that actually, wait a second, these help the inflammation in this COVID-19. And some of the research articles for those are in our our survival guide, which is available on our website. So we're, see, we're now we're coming full circle to this whole idea of maybe inflammation, simply said, more specifically put, endothelial dysfunction in this reactive oxygen species world might be the underlying culprit in the, the very different multifaceted um, expression of this disease that we are now um, learning about called COVID-19. This graphic is more specific to the actual endothelium, which is the smallest, smallest cells lying the smallest arteries in our body, and showing the connection with this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Again, the ACE2, that's where the ACE2 kind of sits, and the association with kidney function, liver function, and lung function. One of the interesting things when you have patients admitted to the hospital, they're using clinical diagnoses such as elevated liver enzymes, such as low platelets, white, low white counts, elevated LDH, um, CRP. CRP is actually made from the liver. SED rate. SED rate is actually an inflammatory marker from the blood. These are all things we're seeing that the underlying, the common thread with all these is endothelial dysfunction, i.e. inflammation. So this may just be the, the key that helps us go forward with therapies as well as treatments with this disease. This is a little more complicated graphic showing the same kind of idea, looking at the connection with the lungs, the liver, the kidneys with the small arteries. And you have to realize that when we start looking at all these, these dots and these lines, the thing that connects all these is actually the endothelium. So endothelial dysfunction, which is the underlying cause for cardiovascular disease, heart attacks or strokes, dementia, autoimmune issues actually might be the underlying issue with um, COVID-19 disease as well. And this is well. And this is where functional medicine lives. Functional medicine lives. Sorry, my there we go. This is where functional medicine lives. Functional medicine lives. The com the combination, the intersection, the connection point for all these things. It's where the small roots in the tree, where the endothelium can be that can be affect with lifestyle, diet, nutrition, stress, sleep. We've talked about sleep and its impact on your immune system for the last eight to 10 weeks. Genetic predisposition, antecedents, those things that set you up for this. You know, is there a way that someone can figure out just for them what might be the things setting them up for this disease? Then looking at your organ systems, seeing how the heart and the lung interact with the kidneys, all these other things. And then looking at the signs and symptoms. It's been really interesting to see how I've learned how to diagnose people based on weird shortness of breath, weird loss of smell, some muscle aches, some weakness, and these 
really what would have been unassociated group of symptoms. But now that I have a bigger view of what this disease is, I'm actually clinically diagnosing people, doing antibody testing on them and having it come back positive. So this is all quite interesting and unique and just really, I think, showing the future forward with this, um, this disease entity. So, so hopefully this last part of this was helpful. Um, having a little, I'm going to move these things around a little bit here. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, as we go forward, I'd like to continue to discuss um, these things through our different educational media on our website, through social media. If this four-part series has spurned any questions, I'd love to um, take those, maybe do a live Q&A later on just to address some of those things. Um, the reality is uh, we are learning so much and so quick. Um, therapies we thought were great for COVID-19 are now obsolete. Things we thought were um, not obsolete have become useful and gone out again. So this is, this is a very quick changing environment. But ultimately, as a physician, the first and foremost thing we're supposed to do is no harm. So anything we do should not harm the patient, should help them, but at a minimum not harm them. And that's where using a holistic integrative approach for patients outside of the hospital can be beneficial to help boost our immune systems and get us prepared, not just for the summer as this is um, trickling through the, the um, environment, but for the fall when we, when we see our next peak. So if this has been helpful, please um, continue to follow us, share this information with your friends. That's how this gets out there is um, by you sharing this with people, your loved ones, friends, people you think this information would be helpful for. Let's um, create some more debate about this. Let's have some more discussion about what's going on and our way forward individually and as a culture. Um, it's been great to be with y'all. Um, again, thanks a lot and y'all have a great day.